the the issue comes that we have a completely polluted set of information available to the public about the nature of the so-called vaccines that were deployed for COVID, about the effectiveness of those vaccines, that's those so-called vaccines, at preventing disease, serious or otherwise, um, and the safety of those inoculations. So what you heard in your exchange with him was a guy who effectively believed the public health apparatus in what it told him and couldn't imagine how anybody would reach a different conclusion. Now, many of us, including me, did reach a different conclusion. And, you know, for all of us, it started somewhere. For, for Heather and me, it started when we were hearing about these so-called vaccines for the first time. And we were told, like everybody else, that these things were highly effective against COVID and safe. And when we heard the claim that they were safe, we knew something was wrong because there is no conceivable way. There is literally no way they could be safe, right? They could have been harmless. They didn't turn out to be harmless, but they could have been harmless. But safe implies that you know at the point that claim is made that they are harmless, that they don't have any long-term impacts that are worth knowing about. And they hadn't been around long enough. There was no prior example of such a inoculation used in another creature that would have allowed us to determine that. So if these people were telling the truth, what they would have said was, well, I don't want to say because I think we now know that this wasn't the truth even then. But if they had said, we don't know of any harms and we don't believe they are likely, but we cannot promise you they don't exist, right? Then it would have been a very different story. But at the point they said, oh, these things are safe, the point is, ah, that's a lie. I don't know why it's a lie. I don't know if they're solving a game theory problem and they actually believe that or they're solving a business problem and I'm the mark. I don't know. But I do know something's wrong with the claim. And at the point that we realized something was wrong with that claim, we started to dig. The further we dug, the worse it got. And, you know, that sort of led us to a second line of inquiry, which was, well, what is the likelihood that a inoculation based on this technology would be safe? And the answer was very, very low. And the reason I say that is because the technology in question, especially the mRNA uh, inoculation or transfectant, um, was so radically different from anything that had been successfully deployed before that the chances it was going to have some impact on the immune system, on the circulatory system, on neurological systems, the likelihood that there was going to be something in there that it disrupted was extremely high because complex systems are that way. There are so many interrelated parts that there's no way to predict what the impacts will be and the likelihood of improving a functional organism with such a thing is low. So I have two questions for you. Sure. One, did you watch uh, uh, the Pfizer CEO at the... Uh Davos being chased down and asked and all the questions and they didn't have a response from did you see that by the way that clip is not on YouTube so we're not going to be playing it it can be on Twitter you can go find it we'll put a link for it if people want to see it but it's a very interesting uh, uh, back and forth for two or three minutes and the guy walked for a long time the question I got for you is the part and this is where a lot of people message me the interview got nearly 100,000 comments is what it got not in the span of six years in the span of two weeks it got 100,000 comments first Six hours, it already had 40,000 comments. Neil deGrasse. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a part where he says there's a public health contract that you have signed implicitly as a citizen of a country where in part we depend on each other for health, our wealth, our security, and the like. And that contract is in the best scientific evidence available at the time. If you do not get vaccinated, you will put other people in this organization at risk. And that organization does not want to take that risk. So you do not have this job anymore if you decline it. So in, in with any public health decision, there has to be a consequence to you not participating in this social contract. Which social contract is he talking about? Public health contract is he talking about? Well, uh, this is exactly what I was getting at when I, I said we should give him his due. In principle, he's not wrong. 
The problem is that the person or the entity into which you have entered this contract, without your choice, by the way, but which you have been forced to enter this contract, is in breach of that exact contract, right? That is why this is a non-question. That is why there is exactly no right to mandate these things, is because in order to have any legitimacy to such a policy, you would have to take every precaution to protect the public from the perverse incentives inside of science, inside of pharma, inside of public health, and no precautions were taken. In fact, what appears to have happened is the complete capture of the system that should be protecting us. So in the case that you had a truly dangerous disease, you had, let's say that we had a uh, a, a true vaccine, something based on a reliable technology, something like an attenuated virus-based vaccine in which proper testing had been done by an independent authority which had evaluated the level of adverse events to be low, had looked at past examples of similar vaccines and said the likelihood that there is something hiding here that we don't know is low. Here are the uh, all-cause mortality statistics on previous vaccines that have been out for many decades, right? Then there would have been at least the basis for a discussion about a mandate. But we are so far from having a structure that is capable of managing that responsibility that it is inconceivable that those mandates would have been justified. And of course, the fact that they did not instantly get removed at the point we discovered these things did not block transmission of the disease tells you this wasn't about public health in the first place. This was about something else. I don't know that we know what that something else was, but it wasn't good. It wasn't about us in the public. It was about something. Perhaps it was business. That's the best case scenario is that this was greed of driving this, but it certainly wasn't keeping people safe. Money. <clears throat> uh, that's the floor. The explanation could be worse, but at, at least this was runaway greed and a complete indifference to the suffering and death of other people's children. Can I just ask a simple question? Th this is not my wheelhouse. Um, this is, I, I would like the audience to maybe get some, some very specific, clear answers. Uh, every country had a sort of a different approach. Every state in America had a different approach. We saw what happened in California, lockdowns, New York versus Florida, DeSantis, all that. If you could uh, give a grade to America's response as a country, and then what countries out there would you give an A to in the response to everything that happened in 2020? I don't think an A was possible. There, you know, if, you know, if we're grading on a curve, you know, Sweden did better. He likes better. the old educational system. Yeah. Well, he wants to know whether he got an A or B. <laughs> right. Planet Earth got an F minus on this one. Okay. And, you know, Planet Earth got an F minus. That's not even harsh enough. Wow. Like, let, let's just be clear about this. No matter what ended up being true about these so-called vaccines, about early treatment, about the proliferation of variants that comes from the vaccination campaign, no matter what we conclude on all of those topics. At the very least, we have a virus that appears to have been the product of a circumvention of a law that was um, created by Congress to protect us from gain-of-function research that resulted in Anthony Fauci using a proxy to offshore that work to the lab in Wuhan, China, where they appear to have enhanced this virus's capacity to infect human beings. Every single bad thing that happened to us, including the trillions of dollars of wealth that got evaporated, all of the people who have been killed by the virus or some consequence of lockdowns or some consequence of these inoculants, right? All of those costs come from that error. So, you know, this is a self-inflicted wound from one end to the other. This is the greatest blunder in human history. And for the same people who are responsible for that blunder to have been put in charge of protecting us when they clearly had perverse incentives was insane. Any country to get an A on this exam would have had to call that out and say, actually, 
this can't be managed by the same people who created it. We need to find the best minds, the most independent minds, and we need to start with a fresh sheet of paper that doesn't involve those people and figure out what the right thing to do is. And if we had done that, even after the virus had gotten loose and spread around the globe, we would have done vastly better. Would there have been deaths? Yes, many. But we would have done vastly better. So the fact that at best provinces ignored the global response and did their own thing and saved their own populations, right? Uttar Pradesh used ivermectin, right? Do we know what the consequence of that was? Not exactly. But we don't know because there is a, an obsession with not finding out, much as there is an obsession with not finding out what adverse events are actually happening at what rate, right, from the uh, mRNA vaccines. So we simply have to escape the people who have control over what questions we are allowed to ask, what we are allowed to study, and we need to figure out what happened so that this can never happen again.